on this Thursday night. It certainly looks that way to me. It's very sad. Donald Trump seems to accept that Jamal Khashoggi is likely dead. So why the president's response still remains wait and see. We said, how much do you need to get ready after royal ascent? They said 12 weeks. We gave them 17. On day two of legal pot, the shortages, the lineups, and the growing pains. How long will Canadian consumers put up with all of that? I did feel that maybe we'd been slightly hoodwinked. And why some big name acts have big questions for Ticketmaster after our undercover investigation. But where some artists are seeing red, others may see opportunity. This is The National. It took long enough, but Donald Trump has finally come to the same conclusion as pretty near everyone else, that dissident Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi is in all likelihood dead. So what to do if he was indeed murdered by a Saudi assassination squad? As Ellen Morrow reports, there are decidedly mixed messages coming out of the United States tonight. It certainly looks that way to me. It's very sad. It certainly looks that way. Donald Trump for the first time saying Jamal Khashoggi is likely dead and the possible consequences if the Saudis ordered the hit. Well, it'll have to be very severe. I mean, it's, it's bad, bad stuff. It's a somewhat tougher tone from Trump as accusations of Saudi involvement grow louder. Today, a Turkish newspaper published photos of a man with close ties to the Saudi crown prince outside the consulate on the day Khashoggi disappeared. Turkey says Khashoggi was killed by a Saudi assassination squad inside that building. We made clear to them that we take this matter with respect to Mr. Khashoggi very seriously. But the U.S. But still seems to be treading lightly with the Saudis. They continue to be an important counterterrorism partner. Uh, they have custody of the two holy sites. Uh, they are an important strategic alliance of the United States, and we need to be mindful of that as well. Today, human rights groups called for a United Nations investigation and for the U.S. to do more. I would like to see uh, President Trump, for example, speak out forcefully uh, for uh, more information, uh, getting the Saudis to um, tell us exactly what happened. I think it's important that we get that signal from uh, the top of the U.S. government. Turkish police continue to investigate and they've expanded their search to a nearby forest looking for Khashoggi's remains. And so Ellen joins us from Washington. Ellen, the White House seems to be doing it, this sort of odd balancing act, trying to appear tough on the Saudis, trying not to harm their relationship. Is there anything more the United States can do? Well, there's been some tough talk here, Adrian, from some senators calling for things like sanctions, for example. But the biggest real response we've seen from the U.S. is Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin pulling out of an economic summit in Saudi Arabia. Now, that's not much, but the U.S. says it wants to see further proof. Now, tonight, there is an unconfirmed report that Mike Pompeo did listen to an audio recording of Khashoggi's alleged killing. So it could be we'll see a tougher response in the coming days. But until that time... We are seeing this balancing act by the administration. Okay, Ellen Morrow in Washington tonight. Thanks, Ellen. You're welcome. Now, it's not like Mohammed bin Salman hasn't already undermined his own enlightened image. As Middle East analyst Bill Law points out, MBS has a ruthless streak. But for now, at least, Donald Trump seems to be sticking with him. Mohammed bin Salman has had a whole series of disturbing uh, judgmental lapses. The Crown Prince has pitched himself as a progressive, modernizing hero, and some bought into that, but now there's genuine fear he's an erratic tyrant. So why did Trump go all in with MBS? Well, there's his son-in-law. Jared Kushner was an early champion of Mohammed bin Salman, calling him the change agent. I think he thought, well, you know, he's a buddy of my son-in-law. Let's let's see how we can help him out. And Kushner's not wrong that Saudi and American interests are aligned in many ways on security, economics, and counterbalancing Iran. But during last year's state visit, Trump said this. We are not here to tell other people how to live, what to do. So did Mohammed bin Salman take that as a kind of permission? Because soon after, the regime isolated Qatar, seized Lebanon's prime minister, accelerated its war in Yemen, killing thousands of civilians, and at home, 
Mohammed bin Salman rounded up anyone he perceived as a threat, including relatives, some of whom are still in custody. And as for his much applauded liberalizations? He got a lot of uh, praise when he announced he was going to allow women to drive. But then just before they were going to be given that uh, great privilege, he arrested many, many women activists. The question many are now asking, can he be trusted? This young man is not someone that uh, can be relied upon. Let's turn now to an international conflict Canadians don't talk about as much these days, but one that remains extremely dangerous. Today in Afghanistan, we saw one of the most devastating assassination strikes in years. Two top Afghan leaders were killed, and the top U.S. commander in the country very nearly killed as well. It happened in what should have been a secure compound in the southern city of Kandahar, the same region where Canadian troops spent six years fighting. The country is two days away from national elections, and the Taliban has claimed responsibility. Senior correspondent Susan Ormiston here now, because, Susan, you have reported from Afghanistan a number of times now. And so what do we know about what happened here? Yeah, well, the shooting happened just after a high-level meeting at the governor's compound with the governor of Kandahar, the U.S. general, and Kandahar's police chief. And ironically, they were reassuring local elders about election security. We know there's going to be some violence, but uh, I'm very confident that your forces are prepared for this election. And then, Andrew, just after that, a small group ushered General Miller to the waiting helicopter, and one of the governor's own bodyguards opened fire and shot the police chief in the back, killed him, killed his intelligence officer. General Miller escaped, but the governor himself was injured. And, you know, it is shocking, even in Afghanistan at this stage, that the Taliban was able to infiltrate the governor's own security detail and get so close to this U.S. commander. Right, and so that is going to be a big question moving forward. Another one, though, is around one of the men who was killed, the region's head of police. Why was he such an important... Figure. He was very important. The most powerful security figure in the South, Abdul Razak, 41 years old, colorful, some say a brutal police commander. But the government in Kabul was relying on him and has for years to keep a steely grip on Kandahar security, keep the Taliban back. And he did that for them. And for the most part, the West complied with that. Now, I want to show you in 2007 in his compound when we interviewed Abdul Razak about Border Patrol and security. He was the head of Border Patrol at the time. We were talking to him about corruption. Uh, very controversial past. He was a warlord before this ascent to state power. And as a chief of a police in Kandahar, he was accused of corruption, of disappearing some in custody. Now, the Taliban hated him. They tried to kill him several times, but he had these deep roots in the intelligence community and a loyal following. And tonight, we're told in Kandahar, many are mourning his death and worried about the days to come. Mm. Well, the days to come, I mean, the timing of all of this is critical. Elections just around the corner. Yeah, the Taliban has got to see this as a big score, a big loss for the Kabul government. In a third of the country, Andrew, it's already too unstable to go out and vote. So there we have this. And now you have Kandahar's most senior political figure, the governor in hospital. I spoke to his brother, Tour Wessa, tonight. He was the Afghan-Canadian who was the former governor of Kandahar. You know, think that the U.S. commander, General Miller, just took over command a month ago. And now he has a very grim taste of what's ahead, particularly with these elections. Senior correspondent, Susan Ormiston, thanks so much. Okay. Here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. Furious reaction from some of the biggest musical acts in the world after a CBC News investigation reveals Ticketmaster's relationship with resellers. Plus, Ottawa's mayor is in hot water for blocking constituents on Twitter. Should elected officials be allowed to do that online? But first, on day two of legal cannabis, the consumer demand is undeniable. But the road to a functioning market is littered with, well, some potholes. There are shortages across the country, in part because so many users are flocking to the legal supply. Hard figures are hard to come by at this stage, but it's clear the Canadians have already spent millions. Day one was amazing. I mean, we, we did about uh, 1,300 orders online, hundreds here in the store. We did about, we were, you know, expecting on a, on a good day that you would normally do about $50,000 in a store like this. We did about $325,000 out of this store.
but elsewhere, shelves sit empty. Whoever's in charge of it should have foreseen that and would I have a lot more on hand. Various factors are at play in Newfoundland and Labrador. Health Canada rejected the labeling by one supplier, so that product is delayed. At least one crop was ordered destroyed for regulatory reasons. BC's government distributor had explained why shortages would hamper the rollout nationwide. There's an insufficient supply of excise stamps required for each product. Some companies that are licensed to produce are still waiting for their sales license. And some crop yields failed to meet expectations. Are these temporary hiccups or an ongoing reality? The CBC's Diane Buckner got some answers. Day two of Legal Weed saw more huge demand. This morning at 8 a.m. I got here and there was two people in line and by 10 a.m. we were back to 150. In Calgary, this store is well stocked for now, but the owner is worried whether there will be enough supply to go around when more stores open. We could be at 20 stores by next week or we can still be at two. Shelves are already empty in this store in Newfoundland. I'm hoping tomorrow, but it's looking a little bit more like Monday. We never really know when we're going to be getting our shipment, but this morning we did receive one box, and that was gone probably within a half hour to an hour. Quite honestly, th there are naturally growing pains in a brand new retail system. And the minister in charge says the industry was given time to get ready. The provinces, territories, and licensed producers asked for time and we said how much do you need to get ready after royal ascent they said 12 weeks we gave them 17. most major growers say they've got inventory these are just first week hiccups we have uh, i think about a hundred thousand uh, pre-packed containers ready to go out and we look like we're going to be about 95 to 100 percent of the requested amounts by each of the provinces uh, will be into their uh, warehouses as we finish this week and into next week this business professor also says don't worry Licensed producers have these plans to build out, or they're currently building out, lots and lots more production capacity. When that's fully built out, there will be plenty of cannabis to supply the roughly seven or so million Canadians who demand it. That can't happen fast enough for some. This is so early days and we're at the point of maximum uncertainty. There's not really enough data where there's any history for us to draw from. As retailers are learning, the history they're writing is unpredictable. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Incredible people are still lining up. As we showed you, legal cannabis is in short supply in Newfoundland. But that didn't stop police from raiding an unlicensed shop in St. John's, led by officials from the Newfoundland and Labrador Liquor Corp. The raid was in progress even as potential customers showed up to buy. Such is the challenge now in weeding out illegal shops. As Briard Stewart shows us, demand is the key reason why it's still business as usual for many sellers. It's not surprising that the day after legalization, things in Vancouver are, well, pretty much the same. There's still a smoky haze inside this lounge where regulars inhale a potent pot concentrate. I usually come here with like five or ten bucks and I smoke a dab or two. Neil Blake has MS and comes here almost every day. I live right around the block from here, so it's just very easy for me to just come in, buy some shattered. Of course, all of this is not allowed under the new laws. Yesterday, RCMP seized marijuana from two dispensaries on Vancouver Island because they didn't have a provincial license. They want us to close for four or five months until we can get approved. We'll go bankrupt by then. But that police raid appears to be the exception. For now, there's a bit of a grace period for other illegal businesses. There are still plenty of places that will sell you weed. Some even advertise online that they'll deliver it in the same amount of time it takes to get a pizza. Are you guys delivering today? Uh, oh yeah, every day downtown. Indica, sativa, we got gummies, chocolates. Given that this province only has one legal pot shop and plenty of others that have been operating for years, the transition will take time. The BC government says more than 40 special constables will be investigating unlicensed businesses that sell marijuana, but enforcement isn't going to ramp up right away. It's going to be gradual because officials say they recognize that a lot of owners have applied for licenses and they want to enter the legal market. Oh, yeah. Don Briere has shut down nine of his 14 dispensaries, but his four illegal locations in Vancouver are still open and busy. He says he's applied for a provincial license, but continues to sell products like edibles, which aren't yet regulated under the new laws.
All of our people are well trained, they're knowledgeable, uh, they have this, these years and years of experience. Engie plans to keep operating as he always has while he waits on whether he can get a license and be legal. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Okay, to a very different kind of legal controversy now. Lots of politicians like to use Twitter to get their message out. You know that. Just ask Donald Trump, for instance. But the decision of Ottawa's mayor to block some critical followers from his feed has led to a test case in the courts and major questions surrounding the accountability of public figures. Hannah Thibodeau has that story. This is Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson's Twitter account. He says he can block you if he wants to. And last month, he did just that. But three local political activists say that's a violation of their freedom of speech and are taking the mayor to court. So I'm not just blocked from tweeting at him or commenting on his page. I'm actually blocked from seeing what he tweets. But it also means it's hard for me to engage in the debate that's happening if I can't see um, what's precipitated the debate. The activists say they simply annoyed him. Watson disagrees. In a statement, he says... This is my personal Twitter account. I have the right not to be attacked and harassed by the same individuals on a regular basis. It's one of the first times that we've really seen this. Elizabeth Dubois uh, examines the political use of digital media. She says there are no defined rules around blocking. The counter of I'm blocking you is you can't get my information. It's a big problem when we're talking about government officials and politicians. Here on Parliament Hill, there are no real rules for politicians. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has suggested that ministers have separate government and personal social media accounts. Environment Minister Catherine McKenna has been threatened before on social media, but doesn't think there needs to be rules around blocking. Uh, look, I mean, I think that, I mean, we're all adults here. Unfortunately, there are some people who don't, who don't want to engage. They would prefer to, uh, you know, say abusive comments um, and sometimes extremely threatening comments. Social media is an interesting beast because part of what makes it an interesting way for us to interact with, with Canadians is the fact that it is a bit more free-flowing with, a, a with less rules in terms of how it works. All say that sometimes you need to block. The line can be drawn with persistent uh, harassment, uh, things that, right, the question is who, who is the arbiter, ultimately. The lawsuit against the mayor is set for January, and it's the first of its kind in Canada. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Some other stories we're following tonight on The National. The New Brunswick government is still in limbo weeks after the election. Not a single one of the elected members wants the role of speaker. It will play itself out according to the law. We're all blessed and fortunate. We don't have tanks running down Queen Street in Fredericton. We have a very stable, good democracy. So the PC party whip, Ted Fleming, seems calm, but for the Liberals, there is a chance this could spell the end of their minority government. If the parties can't work it out themselves, there are two options. The lieutenant governor could ask the Tories to try to form a government, or she could call for another election. When we see uh, incidences of racism or hate, um, all of us need to speak up. And a community near Edmonton is rallying around a local family after it found a despicable letter in the mailbox. It said the Anderson family should go back to their, quote, reserve where Indians belong. Neighbors have sprung into action, dropping by, even planning a block party to show their support. But it might be too late. The Andersons told our reporter that they'll be moving because they don't feel safe. Still ahead on The National, it's at issue night. Pot, politics, pardons, the gang's all here. And meet the intrepid girl guide who made all the right business decisions on legalization. I <laughs> can't wait for that. Plus, anger in the music world after a CBC News investigation reveals Ticketmaster's cozy relationship with resellers. I was pretty angry, um, and I did feel that maybe we'd been slightly hoodwinked. More questions for Ticketmaster tonight. A federal NDP MP is demanding an immediate investigation and has asked that Ticketmaster be called to testify before a House committee following a CBC News investigation that found the company has been secretly working with scalpers. No surprise, artists are angry too. Today, CBC News published leaked emails sent from some of the world's biggest acts demanding answers from Ticketmaster's president. Dave Seigelins shows us what they wrote. 
Mumford and Sons. Tickets for their upcoming world tour went on sale just last week through Ticketmaster. That's despite a major conflict behind the scenes between the box office giant and the band, long on record as anti-scalper. I think that scalping is a kind of parasitic business. Mumford and others are furious after revelations by CBC News. We used hidden cameras and caught Ticketmaster at a conference in Las Vegas, recruiting scalpers, including ones using hundreds of fake identities to buy up tickets. I want to know the straight goods on whether Ticketmaster is going to be policing us using our multiple accounts. Uh, no. I have, I have a gentleman who's got over 200 Ticketmaster.com accounts. The day that story broke, big-named artists confronted Ticketmaster, and CBC has obtained their leaked emails. It was CC'd to reps for acts as big as Bruno Mars, Sheryl Crow, Drake, and Mumford and Sons. It was all kicked off by the manager for Mark Knopfler, former frontman for Dire Straits, now a solo artist. I was shocked. Knopfler's manager says he never intended for these emails to be made public, but he is upset that the box office is colluding with scalpers. I was pretty angry, um, and I did feel that maybe we'd been slightly hoodwinked. Crockford asked in the emails about Ticketmaster's claim that it opposes scalpers. Was this all just bollocks for public consumption, Crockford wrote, when in fact, you're taking a hypocritical and unprincipled stance and actually assisting scalpers? Well, Ticketmaster's president, Jared Smith, replied, defending his reseller program. The press has completely misrepresented what Trade Desk is and who uses it, Smith wrote. Neither it nor we facilitate mass purchase of tickets by brokers or anyone else. Then the manager for Mumford & Sons jumped in. Why be in the business of facilitating brokers at all, he asked. But Mumford is in a tough spot. With an upcoming tour, they need Ticketmaster to sell their tickets. So after these fiery emails, they've struck a deal. Ticketmaster has agreed to not allow resale tickets on its website at all. The band's manager told CBC, the most important thing from our point of view is to keep the fans as informed as possible and to encourage them at every turn not to buy from secondary websites, which is where scalpers and brokers ply their trade. Ticketmaster has declined our latest requests for comment. And Dave joins us now. So, so Dave, beyond Mumford & Sons, what are the options for artists? Well, there are very few. I mean, Ticketmaster has a near monopoly. 80% of the ticketing for big events, uh, across North America anyway. Also, the parent company, Live Nation, actually has contracts with hundreds of artists. So, uh, so they're all so very tied to this company. The other thing I'd say is that not all artists agree. I mean, some artists want to profit from the resale of their tickets because there's more money to be made. Mm. We've heard from our industry sources in our investigation that not all artists are anti-scalping. Some of them may be profiting. We don't know who those artists are, but it shows you that artists aren't united on this issue. That's very interesting. Dave Seglins, thanks so much. Thank you. Next on The National, it's at issue night. Andrew, Chantal, and Andre Demise are here to talk about all that's moving and shaking and rolling and smoking in the country this week. That's next. Our government has delivered on our promise to legalize, strictly regulate and restrict access to cannabis. We've put forward a process on obtaining pardons uh, that is simplified, uh, that will be free for people who have uh, simple possession of, of uh, cannabis. Pardoning is not the way to go. We need to move forward with record deletions. Expungement is the way to go to really to truly rectify the historic injustice. We're going to see how this unfolds and we're going to propose changes uh, to the regime based on the feedback that we see. There is no question that uh, the world is watching Canada. It's true, the world was watching as Canada legalized cannabis. And no, the sky didn't fall. But with one big promise down, the government started on another, pot pardons. In this new era of legal pot, what is the payoff for the Liberals come next election? The Ad Issue gang is here to dig into that and a whole lot more. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. And joining us for the first time, also in Toronto, is Andre Demise. Good to see everybody, and thanks for joining us, Andre. Uh, I don't start with the newbies, so I'll, I'll put you on ice and let the, <laughs> let the, 
the other two start off. Let, let's start with the issue of, of pardons. But, but more, Chantal, I guess, from a perspective of could that lead to uh, political benefit down the road if there's tens of thousands of Canadians out there who might be able to, to change what their criminal records look like? Uh, would there be a, a, a payoff, I guess? Maybe so, probably, if from some of them. But if that were a big uh, political calculation on the part of the Liberals, it begs the question. They've known for months, if not uh, at least a year, where, when that uh, the day when mm -hmm. cannabis was going to be legal was going to be. So how could they not come up with legislation and just promise to draft legislation? It seems to me, with all the apparatus of government, that they could have come up with a bill on uh, Wednesday rather than an intention. Andrew. It does um, beg the question of why people have to apply, first of all, to get a pardon. I've been trying to rack my brain to think of what would be the argument against simply declaring, look, this whole experiment with prohibition was a 90-year mistake. We've admitted it was a mistake as a country. Uh, why then would, she, would the onus be on people to apply to have that uh, either pardoned or expunged from their record? Why wouldn't it just be a blanket pardon for anyone convicted of simple possession? There's an argument for a pardon versus expungement, which is in dealing with the U.S. authorities. Yes which is where they might have a record of your criminal conviction, and this would be a way of showing that the, you've been given a pardon. But beyond that, there, to me, the question is, why is, it, is the onus placed on people who have been convicted in the past of this when there's 500,000 people with criminal convictions, 55,000 just in, I think, the last year under the old regime? It just doesn't seem consistent with it to me. What do you think, Audrey? I, I agree that, uh, you know, going with a pardon versus the blanket expungement doesn't make any sense. Uh, the, the, being a paranoid human being, my first thought goes, the application process to, uh, to be able to get a pardon, first of all, is going to bring up your record to the United States authorities. So if you say you want to go across the border to uh, a cousin's wedding or your aunt's funeral, um, that could be a reason you get stopped at the airport. And uh, second, you'll probably have to get a lawyer to navigate that pardon system, whereas a blanket expungement would have you avoid all of that. So if the government was proactive in arresting people and drawing them into the carceral system, then why can't the government be proactive in simply getting rid of those, uh, those, those convictions? So, so what the government would say, just to, to put that on the record, is that the expungement doesn't erase the records that might exist in the United States. And if you have a pardon, and I think this is what Andrew was alluding to, at least you can say to border agents, oh, this is my pardon, so th this uh, record has been erased. I, I... But, but under any scenario, they could have been more proactive. This issue has been in the House of Commons, raised by the NDP sure. for more than a year. It has. Uh, to just come up with an intention on the day of legalization, to me, sounds a bit strange. And I have to think that it, maybe they just don't have the logistical means to make it happen quickly and they're giving themselves time to be ready for it because what's the point of saying uh, as of today we're going to issue a black blanket pardon mm -hmm. if you can't uh, logistically achieve that well and that could be if it's the no if the numbers are as high but as they seem to think that they are yeah but if that's the case they should say so i mean i say this as somebody who worries about the normalization of marijuana worries about some of the health effects but the fact that, that we ever dealt with this by criminalizing people who used marijuana I mean, maybe it was excusable in the times that we lived in in the past, but now that we've acknowledged that it was just a ridiculous error, that we never should have gone down that road, uh, it seems passing strange that we would leave people with the onus of, of getting that off their record individually by themselves, rather than the government having admitted it was a mistake, taking responsibility itself. Andre, last, uh, last word on that, and then I'm going to change topic. Uh, well, the other, there's another p part to that, and that's that uh, we're talking about simple possession. We're not talking about trafficking. And unfortunately, you know, it's not a, uh, there's not really an objective measure for trafficking. Uh, you can simply have had too much uh, weed on you when you were stopped by police and then been charged with trafficking. So to say that simple possession is where we should stop, I think, is, is a bit of a mistake. There are people that are still in the system um, that probably even had no intention to traffic that are still going to be left with records. Okay, I, I'm going to change topics to something uh, definitely more complicated uh, f for the entire world, I would say. Uh, and this is, of course, Saudi Arabia and how this government and how the world chooses to deal with the, um, th the details around the disappearance of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi. So this is what our Foreign Affairs Minister, Christia Freeland, had to say about that today. Canada's position on human rights in general, very much including in Saudi Arabia, is clear and firm. We took a clear and firm position in August, and I think that is something that Canadians can be proud of. 
So she, she said that today, but earlier this week, she also said that the government wasn't going to back away from selling the light armored vehicles to Saudi Arabia, a, a contract that had been started under the conservatives. Chantal, what do you make of these two messages? And is this uh, coherent? And does it make sense in light of what the rest of the world is doing as well? Oh, I think we are still waiting to see what the rest of the world is really doing. Yeah, On the fair. first uh, statement, the one you aired, I, I do think that uh, some of the countries who stayed silent uh, when Saudi Arabia was coming after Canada for having s tweeted that uh, people should not be jailed without reasons yeah. and should be freed, uh, look a bit, don't look very well, and that Canada looks better uh, for having done that in August. Uh, I also think that uh, some of the former uh, Canadian ministers, John Baird, not to name him, who actually went after the government for that, probably should keep a low profile on this issue going forward. The arms sale, uh, yes, there is the matter of a signed contract, but there is, and you can't hide that fact, the matter of the jobs that are tied to it in southern Ontario. Andrew. Uh, I think we have to go far beyond um, stern tweets in dealing with the situation, and I do think we have to look at things like the arms sales. I mean, this brings up this issue that has been bedeviling the Liberals since they came to power, where they've been defending it, saying, well, we didn't sign this contract, it was under, done under the old government, but the export permits to fulfill it had to be issued by this government. Yeah. They are implicated, made, they made a decision. Now, in other times, you might say, well, Saudi Arabia is in, a, in an ugly part of the world. There, You don't get to pick your allies, et cetera. You can make some real politic arguments. But I think we're into a different territory when we're talking about extraterritorial executions of dissidents uh, against the regime, uh, critics against the regime. This is giving license to, it's not just Saudi Arabia we're talking. We're talking about China doing this. We're talking about Russia doing this. We're in a, a, a moment here when dictators around the world are being emboldened. And they're being emboldened, frankly, in part by the response or non-response they're getting from the White House in Washington, in fact, the defense that they're getting from the president. And they're also going to be emboldened if other countries don't step up in the ways that they can. And I think this does, once again, raise the question of whether this contract should be fulfilled. And I think there'd be a strong argument against it. OK, Andre, your thoughts? I I think when people utter a collective groan, when somebody like Pat Robertson, who is, you know, just a, a moral abomination of a human being, says that the United States shouldn't cancel contracts with the Saudis over this journalist because it's going to cost them $100 billion in arms sales. Now, we're on the same moral plane as a Pat Robertson to say that we can't cancel this contract, A, because another government uh, instituted it, and B, because it's going to cost a couple thousand jobs in London. If, if the, the price of freedom and the price of humanity is going to be less than losing some jobs in southern Ontario, then what are we doing? I, I mean, it's interesting because they also have a piece of legislation going through the Senate that actually um, ramps up sort of what they have to look at in order to issue these contracts going forward. So it, it, in part, they're recognizing that this isn't sufficient. Uh, and for a government that talks a lot about Canada and how it is on the world stage, I don't know. It seems to me yes, uh, like there's an opening for them there. Sure, but pardon the Liberals for having been taken to task by uh, everyone and their sister for having dared to tweet anything yes, and sure. now being taken to task for uh, saying we're going to stay on course on this contract that we've de defended. I'm not saying they should have defended it from day one. But at some point, the, 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 the measure of what the Canadian government should be doing has been shifting as the situation has changed. I think there is some wisdom in, in this case, not taking the lead on this uh, and waiting for those bigger countries who sat back two months ago to actually put some money where their mouths are. Is that, is that fair, Andrew, that this isn't our job to, to, to run this? Well, it's, it's the world community's job, let's put it that way. And that's a fair point of whether Canada can act alone or has to act in concert with other countries. But this is, seems to me has to be one of those red lines. It's true to, that, that realists will say we can't go around cleaning up every country's human rights record. That's, you know, unfortunately probably true. But we can draw some red lines, i.e., not extraterritorial application of their uh, atrocious human rights records. That is, one, it seems to me, one of those lines in the sand that the international community uh, has an opportunity, frankly, at this point to start drawing. And um, now would be a good time. Andre? I would say that trying to hide behind the contracts we signed, to me, it, it comes across as a cowardly position because the Saudis unilaterally canceled uh, a contract to purchase agricultural goods from us and they were expelling diplomats. So wh what exactly is stopping us from uh, selling arms aside from, you know, pr protectionism? I, I just, I see that as an emboldening um, measure. And frankly, we're supposed to be better than that as Canadians.
Okay, I, I, I have one minute left. I'm just going to quickly flip back to pot. Will you be upset if I ask you whether you're going to purchase any now that it's legal? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I never, I don't know, I never smoked uh, dope <laughs> when I was in high school, and I didn't wait 50 years for it to be legal to start. That wasn't the reason why I didn't try. <laughs> Who else? I've, I've you want us to talk about that on national television? <laughs> I, no, I don't know. Might be I don't know. I I'm just that. okay. It was up to you whether you answered. I just thought I'd go there. <laughs> Chantel gets extra points for going there. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Appreciate it. Before we go, uh, make sure to subscribe to our podcast. This week on the podcast, we'll talk more about uh, the cancellation of the cap and trade system in Ontario. Look for it on iTunes and image your podcast app. Our website, cbcnews.ca/slash the national. Okay, uh, next on The National, we'll serve up a slightly different mix of politics and pot. A former prime minister has joined the industry. The great social advances, as I've indicated, come in waves. And this is one of the waves uh, that I think will have Canada showing the way to the rest of the world. If we find her today, I'll be really happy to put her to rest with my mom and dad. Tonight on The National, investigators revisit a cold case in Ontario, literally digging for answers. Noreen Greenlee was 13 years old when she disappeared 55 years ago. Recently, the family received a tip about a car possibly buried in this spot, and investigators thought Noreen's body might be inside. Crews used metal detectors, but in the end, found nothing. And Donald Trump has turned his attention to the thousands of migrants heading north from Central America. The president threatened to deploy the military and close the Mexico border if the large group isn't stopped. This week, several thousand people left Honduras in a convoy that includes families with kids fleeing poverty or gang violence. And Hudson's Bay has pulled a line of hats from its website following an online backlash. The Make Canada Great Again baseball caps did not go down well with many Twitter users yesterday. Some even called for a boycott of the company. The Bay has since issued a statement saying it was never our intention to offend and we've removed this product from our assortment. Well, you've heard that old saying, politics makes strange bedfellows. Well, it only gets stranger when cannabis becomes big business. Whether it's the Prime Minister or the former Speaker of the House, John Boehner, or Governor Bill Weld, it's our goal to surround this business um, with, again, world leaders, people of influence. Yes, former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney joining the board of a U.S. cannabis investment firm. He is one of several retired politicians set to make money from pot after having opposed it while in power. Catherine Cullen asked him about it. And you'll see in the, you know, it takes a while for certain people and certain things to catch up with reality. Brian Mulroney, pot evangelist? The great social advances, as I've indicated, come in waves. And this is one of the waves uh, that I think uh, you'll have Canada showing the way to the rest of the world. He's joined the board of directors of a U.S. pot investment firm. And drug abuse has become an epidemic. Which As prime minister, he took a tough stance on drugs. He says it was focused on lethal substances, but proposed legislation by his government kept pot in the same category as heroin. What do you say to people who might have been arrested for marijuana possession while you were prime minister and who are now going to look at you making some money off this and perhaps raise an eyebrow? Are you serious? The government has already announced its program in terms of looking after these people, and I agree with it. He's certainly not the only ex-politician to cash in on pot. Former Liberal Justice Minister Martin Cochon is chairman of a medical cannabis company. His government did introduce a bill to decriminalize small amounts of pot. There's also Herb Dollywall, a Liberal cabinet minister from the same era. Then there's Julian Fantino, a former police chief and Harper cabinet minister. Asked by the Toronto Sun in 2004 about legalizing pot, he responded, I guess we can legalize murder too, and then we won't have a murder case. We can't go that way. Last year, Fantino started a company to help connect patients with medical cannabis. 
So is it okay to change your stance? The justice minister seemed uncomfortable when asked about Mulroney and Fantino. It's uh, the individual's choice about what they do in their private life. Thanks. But one Liberal MP wanted to weigh in. Sure, I mean, there are lots of different words to describe that, and certainly they're adults and can make their own decisions, but one word that comes to mind is hypocrisy. And my expectation... Mulroney sees it as more of an evolution. You know, if you had told me, Catherine, when I was in office 30 years ago, uh, that same-sex marriage uh, would be on everybody's radar screen today, I'd have said that's a bit of a stretch. But it is, and that's the way social advance occurs. So does this new enthusiasm mean Mulroney might try it one day? <laughs> that's a hypothetical. <laughs> and I don't answer <laughs> hypothetical questions. Catherine Cullen, CBC getting, News, uh, Ottawa. Uh, Catherine, I'm getting a little long in the tooth for this. <laughs> the moment is next. A huge night for a young artist who speaks his mind through his paintbrush. But first, in case you missed it. You may have seen this now viral picture taken by CBC Edmonton reporter Emily Fitzpatrick showing a newly opened cannabis store in Edmonton and the frankly brilliant family who positioned their girl guide daughter right outside the door. Well, meet Alina and Sean Childs. We'd sold cookies in the neighborhood in the past and it was always a bit of a slow process, wasn't it, Alina? So we decided we were going to do things a little differently this year and with the legalization coming up, she decided we decided together that we were going to go try and sell cookies in the lineup yeah. down at Nova. We loaded up the wagon and we headed down to the lineup. And so we talked to the people at the front and then we just walked through the lineup, didn't we? And what did you say to people while you were walking down the lineup? Would you like to buy some brownie cookies? And so we, we went up and down the line a few times and uh, she, we ended up selling out in 45 minutes. They were calling her an entrepreneur. They were saying she was doing awesome. What did you think, Alina? Awesome. Sure is. She made 120 bucks for Girl Guide, selling to the soon-to-be munchie-stricken masses. She's certainly fulfilling the old brownie motto, lend a hand. You are looking at a quiet Canadian sensation, Neam Jane whose impressionistic paintings are sold as fast as they're created. Our Joanna Romiliot has brought you Neam's remarkable story in 2016. It is stunning enough that he's just 15, but even more, painting is how he communicates. Neam is autistic, does not speak, and has some coordination challenges, but he soars with a brush. Now tonight, Joanna was on hand for Neam's big moment, his first big solo art show, and that, of course, is our moment. It's so exciting, it's emotional, um, I'm proud. How he wants to express to others of what he sees in this world comes out in his artwork and it comes out in the colors, it comes out in the layers, it comes out in the way he blends his work. If I can see his soul in his painting, all the rest doesn't matter. That's the reason actually these paintings are so powerful, because he needs to communicate. Look at the work. It is disciplined, knowing that there is no filter between him and his creative craft. And for me, what is impressive is that there is pure, unadulterated joy. Maybe we all don't need to speak, and maybe all of us should paint a little more. <laughs> dance a little more, laugh a little more, and he is obviously enjoying himself. And the feelings, the emotions, the love, the happiness, I mean, he's found a passion, he's found something that he loves to do, he's got a voice, and he's learned so many life skills and social skills, and just so many things comes out of art. Yeah, I like how it's beautiful. So when Joanna first told the story of Neam uh, a couple years ago, one of the things that was really striking is that the collectors and the dealers were saying that they can't figure out how he was able to master and perfect the technique of the abstract Impressionist masters. Mm. Uh, they were struck by it, and some of them are saying tonight that they've seen a real progression even since then. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I certainly don't know enough about art to, to be able to judge the artwork in any meaningful way, but, but I'll <laughs> say this, th those paintings are bold as heck, right? It, it, it is like, like pure joy walking up to you and, and then just like giving you a good shake. That's what it feels like. 
<laughs> and he's and he's selling them. He sold two so far today of that show, and they each went for five thousand dollars. So as well as bringing him lots of joy uh, and allowing him to communicate, he's got a whole business going as well. Hmm. That's the national for Thursday, October eighteenth. Thanks for watching. Good night. Good night.